The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. And welcome to The Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we gather to cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. Uh, my name is Raven. And it's good to see everybody today. This is the final session in a four part series that we've been doing here uh, with Nina Power on sex and love and friendship. And today, Nina will be talking about men and women, the relationships between men and women. Can there be a reconciliation between the sexes? So that's our juicy topic for today. As usual, we're going to have about 20 minutes of lecture from Nina, and then we will go into the live Q&A uh, portion of the, of the morning, I guess. And uh, you can throw your questions into the chat. I will call on you, and you can have a dialogue with, with Nina. And this will also be on YouTube. So if you do not want to be on YouTube, just put your uh, preference in, in your chat, and uh, I can read the question for you. And with that, Nina. You want to take us away? Yes. All right. Thank you, Raven and Peter. And yes, as, as Raven said, this is the final session of this ongoing discussion. And some of you uh, may have been in, well, some of you definitely were in the earlier sessions um, where we went through in a quite overlapping way, questions of love and marriage and sex and friendship. So there's quite a lot of uh, palimpsest thinking going on here, uh, unsurprisingly. Um, today, I suppose, I wanted to um, <coughs> not cough, um, to think about like a, a, a sort of uh, reconciliation. I think I was talking last week about the idea of mapping on the French Revolution to the sexual revolution and the different phases of uh, revolutionary and counter-revolutionary um, periods. So after the French Revolution, you have the terror um, in which those people deemed not revolutionary enough are kind of caught up and guillotined. And then you have Thermidor as a kind of period of uh, almost like a thaw. And so I was kind of comparing the initial sexual revolution to the, you know, the fervor and the fanaticism of the first part of the French Revolution. And then the terror would be something like the backlash against that, which could be seen as something like Me Too and the kind of, um, let's say, uh, sort of tearing apart of uh, the relationship between men and women, a kind of suspicion between the sexes. And then the third part then would be something more like a reconciliation, like what happens after these kind of moments of uh, libidinal explosion, let's say in the middle of the 20th century, and then a kind of cooling down and then, you know, um, this moment of the, the backlash and then what happens next, basically. So I've been thinking about this question for quite a long time. I've been researching this book on men and masculinity for a couple of years, which I mentioned, which will come out next year, probably halfway through the year. Uh, and it's called What Do Men Want? And uh, it's quite a funny title and it's quite a funny book in some ways. Um, but I think there are some kind of serious questions for everyone as we find ourselves surrounded by questions of desire, of technology, of separation. Obviously, we're all still in this pandemic. It's kind of uh, ongoing uh, enforced rules about who can who you can meet officially and, and not otherwise. And there are no doubt these kind of major transformations happening in the way that we will be allowed to live and be free and be together, all of which um, you know, are significant for, for everybody. And I wanted to begin by mentioning a book from 1969, which is called Society Without the Father. And it's by a kind of um, a man called Mitterschlick. And it's a book that looks at what happens when you have, uh, as it says, a kind of post patriarchal world. So a society that kind of lives without the idea of the, the patriarch. And, and we can think of the patriarch in several different ways. There's obviously a kind of feminist critique of the idea of kind of male dominance, whether it's in terms of power, possession, um, treatment of women, um, hereditary uh, questions and so on. 
Um, but there's another aspect to patriarchy, which is also the idea of the, the patriarch as the one who cares, the male father figure, as you would find in the, the Bible in particular. And the patriarch is also then the one, the man who looks after everybody else that kind of takes responsibility. And one of Mitterschlick's arguments um, in 1969, so he's writing at the height of the kind of sexual revolution, is that in a way that kind of father figure has disappeared. The idea of the, the kind of re responsible um, paternal figure is, is no longer kind of present. And he says in some ways there are good reasons for this because when you have strong father figures, they can become like Führers, you know, like, like these kind of demonic, despotic dictators. And we can see sometimes that there is still a kind of desire for these sort of strong men ideals in politics, whether we have like the clown versions, um, you know, or not that, you know, there's still kind of like a, a desire on the part of a kind of libidinal uh, political economy, often for a kind of strong paternalistic carer um, who has a, a male, uh, who is male, basically. And so he says, it's, it's, you know, it's a kind of dialectical book. Um, but what he says happens when you have a society without this kind of paternalism in the caring sense is that it becomes horizontal, that men and women become more like brothers and sisters rather than in any other kind of relation. So that there's a kind of sibling rivalry that permeates um, post-patriarchal society. And I think we can absolutely see this in uh, the workplace, for example, men and women are basically more or less interchangeable from the standpoint of a kind of post-war capitalism in which it doesn't really matter who does the job in particular. Some jobs are very gendered still, of course, men tend to, to do the more risky jobs um, still. Um, but there's a kind of, um, also in the broader culture, a kind of competition. Um, the idea of that men and women are more or less kind of similar and um, after the same kinds of things, whether it's sex or recognition or consumer goods or particular jobs. And so that kind of question of rivalry in a very horizontal world um, starts to kind of take over how we see things. And I think this is um, part of what's going on with the kind of um, suspicion and the encouragement of suspicion often by the media. And if you think about in the last few years, we've had some very dominant phrases and mantras about toxic masculinity, um, about even things like mansplaining and manspreading and these kind of uh, critical terms that are used to sort of um, indicate particular forms of uh, negative male behavior. Um, and they may or may not have some truth to them. I don't deny for a second that there, there may be something there. Um, but they're part of a kind of broader campaign, if you like, which has as its consequence a kind of division between the sexes, a kind of suspicion between them, which is also amplified um, by things like Me Too in many ways, that the idea that any kind of um, relation between men and women, particularly like at work, let's say, is something to be avoided or is something kind of potentially dangerous, um, you know, might cost you your job or, you know, there's a kind of uh, very, uh, in, you know, dominant sort of fear. Um, and it was interesting, I think I've mentioned before, but in France, the response to Me Too, there was a very uh, famous letter, important letter by Catherine Deneuve and other, many other women um, criticizing Me Too for what they saw as its kind of restriction of women's sexual freedom. The idea that Me Too then started to treat women as if they were kind of um, vulnerable victims and, and like children um, rather than participants um, as adults. Um, so if there was a kind of, um, proper horizontalism, let's say, even if we were had problems with that idea of the kind of horizontal sibling rivalry society, then it would be to treat men and women um, as equal players in a game, like a game of friendship or sex or romance, um, rather than uh, reinstate a kind of hierarchy between men and women with men always being the kind of horrible oppressors and women always being the, the kind of victims. I think that's not kind of coterminous with most people's experience of life, friendship and relationships in, in any case. And I think it's worth asking who benefits from the idea that men and women are um, should be kind of mutually um, hostile almost to one another. Uh, I think there's a lot that is lost, of course, in that um, idea. So um, one of the ways of thinking about this is to think about our relations in terms of this idea of heterosociality, which is to say we live in a mixed world in which men and women are together often in the workplace, in the world, 
um, in their friendship groups. Um, um, but it's not dominated by sex. It's not straightforwardly a heterosexual world, right? Regardless of people's sexual um, orientation, it's that the, the question is more, how does the world operate? How does the world look like? We don't live in a segregated world. We see each other all the time, you know, usually not in a flirtatious or sexual way, right? We have encounters with uh, men and women um, kind of con um, constantly. Um, and you know, to see the world in a kind of dominated by a particular image of Eros, to go back to week one, you know, the very narrow image of love in the Western world, which is a kind of mixture of, of eroticism and possession, um, but rather to see the world through the lens of like all of these different kinds of love, um, friendship, philia for the Greeks, um, amongst others, um, would be to kind of open up the potential for different kinds of relationships between men and women. And I think the men and women are often friends it's not something that's um, necessarily talked about um, enough, I think, so perhaps surprisingly in some ways. You know, a lot of people would be very cynical about the idea that men and women could be friends. They would say that it, it would always degenerate into a kind of sexual tension or that it, you know, there would be no point in being friends or that men and women are too different or people would prefer to spend time with their own sex. Um, but I don't think so. I think there are kind of many opportunities for a dialogue between uh, men and women and, and that male and female friendship um, is something to be kind of noted and, and celebrated um, for its own kind of pleasures and, and qualities. Um, and so one of the things I was keen to talk about in, in the work that I've been doing is to try to expand particular ideas of kind of playfulness and different forms of relation so again, we're kind of dominated by a particular image of um, game playing. If we look at dating, which would be something like the pickup artist idea of the game, going back to Neil Strauss's book, um, and this idea that there are kind of particular tricks, almost like uh, neuro-linguistic programming tricks you can use in order to kind of hook somebody. Um, and, and in a way now that kind of um, image of the game uh, pick up artist game seems really dated you know of course it is it, it involved men going to bars in real life and talking to women they didn't know in order to try out these kind of little games um you know like the idea that if you criticize a woman but also say something nice she'll kind of be interested in you because you've sort of you know piqued her interest but you've been critical and this kind of thing like there, there are lots of these different sort of tricks um you know, and pickup artistry obviously developed over the years as, you know, through dating apps and so on. And I do think it's very, very interesting that um, some of the main figures involved, you know, in particular, this guy called Roosh, um, who's a very kind of, was a very notorious pickup artist, has actually converted to Christianity um, and become sort of very religious and has turned his back on um, his kind of previous sort of uh, numbers game, you know, the idea that it's just a, a question of collecting uh, notches on your bedpost, you know, he's become much more religious and spiritual and um, renounced that kind of life. And I think there's something very interesting in that. Um, you could see it cynically as well, if you if you like, but I do think that there might be something um, to his realisation about those kind of games, you know, the limited quality that of simply treating someone as a means to an end, rather than as an end in themselves. Um, and Neil Strauss as well also, you know, finds um, a different kind of relation, you know, that isn't one of merely collecting um, numbers, um, but rather a deeper um, and more kind of emotional and, and real form of love um, in his own life. And I think that, you know, it's very difficult, even in this, um, you know, very consumerist, cynical world, to give up on the idea of finding somebody to love and to be with, um, whether one is committed to monogamy or, or polygamy, <laughs> I would say that, polyamory. <laughs> you're not really allowed to marry more than one person. But whether you're committed to being with one person or several, I, I think there's still behind that, the desire for um, companionship. Um, but as I say, I think friendship is also kind of massively um, overlooked. And you know, one of the kind of more tragic phrases of our time, that some young people seem to use often is this idea of the of don't catch feelings. You know, the idea that the worst thing you could do is to um, fall in love with somebody or feel something uh, for somebody else, even if you're in an intimate or sexual relationship with them, which seems very um, 
uh, sort of sad in a way uh, that that would be like the most awful thing you could do you know because it would involve real emotion it would involve pain and suffering and um, you know possible heartbreak you know and I'm actually very interested in these questions of what it means to be rejected you know I think it's it's very at odds with a consumer culture that um, pushes the idea that what you want you get you know and to actually have to deal with rejection at the level of heartbreak by uh, not being desired by somebody else whether it's sexually or otherwise is something again that's really overlooked and I, I wrote this short text called platforms last year which was an attempt to kind of really um, describe this feeling of rejection um, because partly I felt that there wasn't enough uh, literature um, you know sort of it was like a kind of semi-fictional text short text that tried to um, describe those feelings of um, you know sexual rejection romantic rejection in a way that was um, attempting to be kind of um, honest, you know, and to, to say this is how um, how horrible it is, and but actually how common it is, and and you know, several people who've read it said, you know, that's a really important thing to write about because it's it's not something that people kind of often want to admit, you know, or to face up to or to to accept, and so there's a kind of numbness and a cynicism that kind of perhaps all too easily comes in in the face of the possibility of, of experiencing real possible pain, because to be with someone is to take a risk always, you know, and to commit to somebody, you know, if it's a mutual commitment, even at the level of a friendship, you know, and friendships go wrong too, and, it, and it's brutal. Um, you know, I was working also on friendship in the last couple of years, and a lot, I, I invited random strangers to come and talk to me about friendship, and, a lot of people for a lot of people what they wanted to talk about was having lost a friend and that was more important to them than losing a partner in some cases that you know losing a friend whether of the same sex or a different sex was absolutely brutal to people and again it's the kind of thing that's often not really kind of described or, or discussed enough um i think um so in in my just to kind of conclude in a way in my idea of a kind of truth and reconciliation um <laughs> between men and women it would be to try to establish some kind of um, balance and complexity and to recognize the different kinds of games that are potentially um, playable that are not sort of merely reducible to kind of ones of sexual um, um, interaction you know and that that you know I think that to recognize that we live in a very mixed world and that there are things that we can learn from everybody we meet you know is quite an amazing thing I mean, I have male friends who for a very long time only really saw the world in terms of sexual conquests. So they would see the world in terms of whether women were good looking or not. And, you know, and in a sense, then a lot of women were simply invisible to these men. You know, they just didn't feature in their mental landscape. Um, and I think there's something, you know, when, when my friend, one of my friends in particular realized that this was how he saw the world, that it was actually kind of quite a brutal moment for him and in, in a way um and for him to kind of understand that there was actually much more to be gained from having conversations with people that he didn't necessarily want to have sex with and perhaps this is something that you know comes with age or wisdom um and a kind of uh broadening of interest uh in the world um so i think to to finish really is to, is to kind of you know, to to shift the suspicion um, away from the opposite sex in the in both the case of men and women to not start with a suspicious attitude, but rather be suspicious of those kind of media stories and those kind of arguments that seek to push um, a division. You know, that seek to try to say that men and women are really in opposition to one another, or that there's kind of resentment should be the first uh, position that each sex takes towards the other. And I think we're surrounded by those kind of uh, narratives you know that that but both from kind of met some of the men's rights activist stuff but also from some of the kind of mainstream you know supposed feminist work which also you know pushes this idea that resentment is the first mode um that we should adopt in dealing with um the opposite sex and i i just think you know there's we have to ask who benefits from that kind of divisive um idea when there is so much more to kind of be gained in the pleasure of conversation and interaction and all of these you know 
sort of strange and wonderful um, discussions and and ways of being together um, that we can have. And I I mean maybe after the kind of pandemic is over, if it, if it's ever over, um, you know there will be perhaps a kind of renaissance. You know, often after plagues, there are kind of cultural renaissances and, you know, this could therefore include perhaps um, a more sort of um, subtle and playful and beautiful um, forms of um, relation between uh, men and women. And, and that's my sort of positive, optimistic um, hope that I will leave you with for the, to begin with. Excellent. All right, everyone, uh, just start throwing your questions in the chat uh, and then we can start kind of going back and forth with Nina. I guess, Nina, you mentioned this kind of open-ended question. You're like, okay, who benefits? Kind of want to know, what do you think? Do you, do you think that there's a, <laughs> uh, who do you think is benefiting from this? And um, that does seem like if we're going to, on a kind of mass scale, uh, have a reconciliation between the sexes whatever this force is that's kind of stirring up this trouble might need to be uh rejected publicly uh and what would that thing what would that thing be yeah i mean it, it's 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 difficult to talk about some of this stuff without starting to sound like madly conspiratorial right you know whenever you do these kind of you know <laughs> key bono so it's like you know is it financial is it like can you know who's actually getting something from this i mean i think you know, on some very basic level, the media love encouraging supposed division between anybody, right? It's like how you sell stories is like by by suggesting there's a problem or a contradiction, which may have some truth to it, but you know, it's kind of expanded because it sort of is a story and it sells things and you know, and I, I think you know, so there's partly that, and that's just very simple, you know, that these kind of ideas like let's say let's take something simple like um mansplaining you know it's a it's an interesting idea in some ways it's sort of tied to Rebecca Solnit but not only you know she wrote a book called men explain things to me and you know it it, it surely is an experience that many women have had right also an experience that many men have had from other men as well no doubt but the idea of somebody wanting to tell you something, particularly if it's something that you know about, and then them kind of dominating the conversation. And, you know, uh, this is kind of an irritating experience because it's not a proper dialogue in the first place, right? It's not a kind of, um, you know, back and forth. It doesn't have this kind of engagement. It's sort of like being maybe, you know, lectured to in a slightly patronizing way. I mean, another way of looking at that though is to say, well, sometimes people are really excited about things that they know about and they want to tell somebody. And actually there's a kind of enthusiasm in kind of conveying and explaining something that's actually extremely charming. You know, and I think to, to depict all of that as simply some kind of um, terrible thing that some men do to, to most women is to, again, to kind of absolutely reduce like the experience and, you know, the, the possibility of, of having a conversation, you know, and, and no doubt some women can go off on one about something as well. I mean, it's a kind of, it's a possibility of human conversation that that happens, you know, that there's a, there's an asymmetry that maybe one person isn't aware of, you know, so, I mean, it's a kind of thoughtfulness that everyone could benefit from really, you know, but, but at the same time, it's in a way, so what if someone tells you about something and you could say, well, you know, oh, that's really interesting, or I know this about that, or, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of, when those sort of, I mean, it's almost like a playfulness as well. It's like, okay, that's a jokey word, you know, mansplaining, you know, let's not take it so seriously. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a funny name for something that sometimes happens rather than you know, a horribly oppressive thing that happens constantly and, you know, is awful and, you know, because then you're just going to end up in situations where men are too afraid to say anything because they don't want to be called toxic or, you know, domineering and, and again, that's kind of too, like, frightened, you know, and I think the fear, you know, it's, it's how do we overcome a lot of the fear which goes to the point about pain and suffering that I was saying as well. You know, if everybody is desperately running around trying not to catch feelings and avoid rejection and, you know, like, you know, not wanting to be intimate or to feel things, then 
then you're just never going to feel anything you know it's it, it also suits a world in which people are sat at home on their computers watching porn and never having proper interactions with anyone else you know there is always a risk there's a risk in being alive you know every moment is a risk you know and i think to live in a very risk averse society is 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 very detrimental to the the fullness of experience you know however brutal you're here um great adam would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question Is he out there? Sorry, yeah. Okay. Uh, no problem. <laughs> hey, what's going on? Hey, Adam. Um, just was, okay, so in the States right now, we were simultaneously told to stay away from our families for Thanksgiving to stymie the flow of COVID-19. But also the malls, are still open for shopping on Black Friday. So I was wondering your thoughts on the idea that uh, disconnecting us from love, not only love between lovers, but also love of family and friends is a, a useful technique for turning us into even more perfect neoliberal subjects. Well, well, yeah, you, you surely know I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> yeah. um, no, no, for sure. I mean, and, you know, particularly in the first week, we were talking about these different kinds of love, like love between friends and family, and in a way, the way that the way in which those are being completely eroded. And yeah, I mean, absolutely, we can see this if, if everything is reduced to a kind of, um, you know, relations of consumerism and commodification, and then everyone else becomes a commodity, like everyone's just a kind of picture on an app and, and you know, everyone is sort of exchangeable. Right, this is obviously the death of all forms of um, relating uh, that have any meaning whatsoever. And yeah, I mean, if you read the work of like Bernard Stiegler on generations, you know, what's being taken away in the kind of criticism of the family or even in the, you know, the, the um, you know, one consequence intended or otherwise of separating people from their families at religious holidays or traditional holidays is of course the elimination of the transmission of knowledge from generation to generation you know and there is a kind of um position that seeks to so so so-called abolish the family you know that um that seems all too compatible with this neoliberal commodification of everything yeah um, you know that, that I don't think there's a radical thing. You know, I, obviously people like R. D. Lang and David Cooper, and you know when they the invention of kind of anti psychiatry, so called, they're very critical of the family as a as an institution, right? Because the family is also where violence happens, where you know, you know, it's it's a the place where it, when people have kind of mental health problems, that's really the incubator. And, and what they're trying to say is to isolate the individual and to blame the individual for their own suffering without taking into account the relations and the position that they're in, in the family situation, you know, just doesn't, will never understand. It will never be able to understand what that person is suffering and why. But I think the critique of the family is not the same as this idea of a kind of abolition of the family in the name of a kind of like, technophilic atomized you know artificial womb like we don't need each other we don't need to reproduce we can form our own sort of communities um that are based around our sexual desire um you know that that is really uh yeah i mean just coterminous with a kind of capitalist transhumanist silicon valley fantasy right, yeah. of the you know the individual with the individual without family you know and i think Families are very ambivalent places. Of course they are. You know, you have to disagree with people. You don't have to, but usually, <laughs> you know, they involve disagreement, um, you know, criticism, like your parents saying, like, what are you doing with your life? Or, you know, things that people don't want to hear. And yeah. if we have a society that's purely based on what people want to do rather than what they should do, like the elimination of duty, like, let's say, you know, then nobody will feel any duty to go and see their family at all because it's right. going to possibly be be painful. And, uh, you know, that, then we are just purely in a kind of liberal desire chaos, right? Totally. Yeah. Cool. Adam, do you have a follow-up? Anything? 
No, that's basically where I stand on the position as well. But it's just fascinating because I remember, you know, Agamben was called a total nutbag at the beginning of a, or a lot of people got really angry at him at the beginning of the pandemic for starting to talk about what was going to happen to humans and basic human relationships during the pandemic. And now you're kind of seeing uh, like almost a blatant conspiracy theory version of events play out. But um, yeah, but thanks, Nina. I'll talk to you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a message on Twitter if I think of another question. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, Amy, let's hear from you. Hi. Um, so I was, this is kind of going back to what you were talking about regarding the kind of, the kind of idea of men and women being friends. And I've found in recent years that um, I feel like there's like this degradation of, or like a loosening of the acceptable language um, that men and women use to, when they talk about each other, like the term trash men and men are trash and things like that. That's kind of just bandied about by women as though it's it's just completely like oh that's that's a normal and acceptable thing to say and similarly with men there are a lot of um very unkind and unpleasant ways in which men can describe women and I was wondering like what if you feel like this is like I feel like this is part of the whole problem is that there's just like like a degradation of like rules and mores around the way that people speak about each other yeah, totally. I mean, I completely agree that that's, that's what's happening. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's almost like there's a kind of sneering cynicism, you know, like when people say, well, not all men are like that, let's say, it's like, that's the most stupid thing you could say, you know, of course, or, you know, it's like, as if to defend men or to say, that's not my experience, you know, some men are good, some men are bad. In fact, we're all good and bad, you know, we're all like, that, that would be embarrassing to say, you know, that the cool thing to say is that, like, as you say, men are trash. I mean, in the book, I look at this hashtag, which was briefly popular, which was kill all men. Um, you know, and of, of course, like the idea was that it was used in a jokey way because, you know, it's like women are uh, fighting back, at, you know, and that women don't tend to cause physical harm to men. I mean, of course, it's a really small proportion of men that hurt women too, but they do so obviously at higher rates than women hurting men, right? So the idea that it's like, because women are oppressed, therefore they're allowed to use this kind of language to describe their oppressors, right? And we, we hear that kind of logic all the time. Um, but, you know, there is something kind of, yeah, like you say, it, it degrades our being in the world and our being with each other if we um, use this kind of language, you know, and, and these kind of generalizations you know, to say like all men are trash or kill all men or, you know, all women are bitches or, you know, I mean, and you see it on both sides. It's like the, you know, the more extreme aspect of some of the men's rights activist stuff in the, in the manosphere, you know, of course it's the same kind of generalizations. It's like all women want is like money and, you know, whatever. It's like that there is, there's equal resentment. Maybe, you know, I did, whether it doesn't need to be equal, but there's resentment on both sides, right? And a, and a kind of quest to generalize and degrade. And I think you could, I mean, maybe see this also as a form of protection against that kind of pain and suffering that I was also talking about. Like, if you can cynically say, well, I don't care, you know, like, it's almost like to pretend that you don't care as well. It's like, no one can hurt me. You know, I'm just imper impervious. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. And I, I think that, the language that we use to talk to each other and about each other, you know, should be much more carefully thought about. You know, it's too easy to slip into these these derogatory modes of thinking, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, there are some truly terrible things we could call each other. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But why should we, you know? It's like more interesting to not do that apart from anything else. Great, Amy, do you have a follow-up? No, I'm good for now. Great. Hal, what do you, you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, uh, yeah, and no, I put in the I put in the chat that, uh, yeah, at once men are expected like not to ask women out at work or places like that, but also being an incel, like that's also a bad thing and you're seen as like alt-right and you, 
but then also like dating apps themselves. I mean, I was using dating apps earlier this year, but they're like very objective. Basically, most dating apps is just like you basing it exclusively based on somebody's appearance. So like, what are you actually like supposed to do at that point? Aren't all these options being like the options kind of undermining feminism in a way? Because basically you're steered into a position where, especially now with the coronavirus, like, like I know people who've gotten people who do dating apps and I was looking at dating apps myself, but it's really just like, it's a really objectifying way of looking at people to begin with. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I think this is like precisely the, the sort of conundrum or the series of, um, I don't know, obstacles and problems. It's like, yeah, if you can't in your everyday life, you know, um, make any approaches to anybody because it's you might lose your job or <laughs> whatever then no one's going to do that um and then the only alternative is like a algorithm or you know an app that shows you the picture of somebody um you know it it, it removes that kind of older possibility of meeting someone in real life getting to know them maybe being their friend you know because that's that's sort of cut off it's like why would you do that if you can you know, you're supposed to use the apps. You're not supposed to go to a bar and just randomly speak to people. And in a way, that's why the early pickup artist stuff is, is in a way braver because they really were going and talking to actual people, running the risk of being punched in the face or having a drink thrown at them or, you know. And so the, the kind of risk element, again, is sort of taken out. And I, I, yeah, I do wonder, I mean, let's say, let's hope that the kind of lockdowns end and that there's a kind of return to you know, mixed heterosocial life and, and people bump into each other and start conversations and, you know, for, for not necessarily for romantic reasons at all, but just because it's interesting to talk to other people. And then those kind of possibilities reemerge. And, you know, for the longest time, I was thinking that there would be like a third summer of love. I was obsessed with this idea, you know, and I thought it would be this summer, lol. <laughs> but instead, everyone was kind of gulagged in their houses. But it really seems to me that periodically, like humanity needs or wants, you know, this kind of collective, like festive ritual, you know, that actually coming together for the sake of a kind of, um, you know, like it would be rave in the 89, 90s in the, in the UK. And then like the first summer of love, like 67, 68, you know, that, that we're overdue a kind of periodic collective uh, explosion of human being together. You know, and that that actually going down this path of like Zoom and being stuck in your house and so on is obviously completely antithetical to that, you know, where anything could happen almost like and it doesn't have to be a rave. Right. That's just one idea, you know, but there was something about the illegal aspect of that, like the free song of being together, like in fields, being outside, you know, which seems so far removed from anything that happens now, you know, this kind of individuating situation. And um, so I, I think that maybe, for particularly younger people, there might just be a way in which those rules get broken, that people will just start to not uphold these kinds of um, rules anymore and, and start to hang out in, in different ways. I can't see any other way around it, you know, and, and um, you know, I think it's a natural desire for people want to want to be together and to meet and to talk. And I wonder if there will be a turn away from computers you know that people will be so sick of online interaction and apps that there will be like a mass rebellion this is again very optimistic <laughs> idea but yeah i i see your the conundrum how yeah let's hope for that next year summer of summer of love yeah 2020. <laughs> 2021 just one year late that's yeah. fine <laughs> um okay so thanks for your question Hal. we're gonna go to david would you like to unmute yourself oh thank you mm -hmm. um <clears throat> wow there's a lot to think about here um yeah i wrote something in the in the in the questions but my mind has wandered from that question um because uh some of what uh, Nina is talking about um, leads me to wonder about friendships, about friendships, men and women. Um, the, the, one of the things I find with, I, I love my friendships 
with women because I can actually do a lot more communicating. It's it's deeper. It's uh, it's more interesting by by quite a ways by quite a far ways. Um, and because I'm 63, I am not really interested in dating um, that whole that whole part. I don't have I don't have that part leading in creating tension. Um, although I do still find that it it lingers with my relationships with both both men and women. Um, because I tend to be around a lot of homosexual men also, but this, um, this potential to be rejected or for people to suddenly disappear online. I don't, I'm not even talking to people that are in my same state. <laughs> um, so there's a degree of risk or maybe even not risk, uh, engaging in a short, a one hour conversation, getting to know somebody a little bit, but then knowing that I'm never going to see them again. Maybe the future is very short relationships. Uh, the, the one thing that uh, the STOA seems to give me is an opportunity to grow a lot, to, to learn new ideas. And so it, it really enhances my self-awareness and my self-growth but in terms of the older traditional values of relationships that I can depend on, this is what I think is leaving. I don't like this idea, but it, it looks like um, people are less long-term committed to me. I don't know. And I also wrote something in the uh, comments, um, but I don't want to ask too long of a question or give you a... I can come back and ask the thing that I wrote in the question if I if if uh, you have time. Yeah, no, thank you. I really um, I get your point completely, and I think you know, undoubtedly, what you're talking about there is the kind of commodification of friendship. You know that as well. It's like everything has its like little slot, and it has its little um, yeah exchangeability, and that it, the idea that other people are interchangeable. And I think this obviously goes against um, older ideas of loyalty, you know, like loyalty between friends would mean standing by somebody, you know, particularly when they were being attacked or when they were behaving badly or, you know, that, that, that you would stand by somebody out of loyalty to the friendship. And I think something like those virtues and those values are obviously dispensable in a world in which you can replace someone with somebody else. You know, the, the question would be, what do people see as a, um, it, you know, do people see meaning in longevity? You know, having a long-term relationship with somebody, whether it's a romantic one or a friendship one, you know, do people still understand the value of those things? You know, what does it mean to be friends with someone over the course of 40, 50, 60 years you know and again that goes back almost to the question of family and duty and you know spending time with people that you might not even agree with that you but you have other other kinds of ties too you know so just as the internet opens up the possibility of being able to speak to people all over the place like this you know at the same time it also allows for the possibility of yeah brutal forms of severance and all of those words like ghosting and so on started to come into the general discourse <laughs> a few years ago you know that it's possible just to cut people off to to block them to unfriend them you know that the model the computer the internet model then starts to permeate back out to real life and i i agree i think it's it's extremely dangerous so in place of that i would say i would stress these older virtues and to to cling on to loyalty above all. Thanks for the question, David. Uh, Peter, would you like to ask your question? All right. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Aristotle's three friendship model, uh, utility, pleasure, and virtue. Um, I feel free to push back on that entire framework, um, but let's just assume yeah. that's, that's true. Uh, so the third one is hard even amongst men. Um, but I'd say extra hard with a man and a woman, especially if there's sexual or romantic attraction involved. 
whether it's symmetrical, like new relationship energy, what the public community calls it, or asymmetrical um, limerence or being friend zoned. Uh, and two problems I see here is that if men are not in the right relationship with each other, aka the virtuous relationship, and I, I would say majority of uh, men aren't, um, then you know it's going to be hard for them to get in that right relationship with women, that virtuous kind of friendship. And um, two, I would also say that there's a lack of sophistication, both on the propositional and participatory level, about the various strong felt sense pulls involved in sexual and romantic attraction. Um, like the irrational poles. And I think the poly community earned like a sophisticated understanding and vocabulary around this due to kind of all the, the practice that they had, but regular folks do not. Um, so they're not really skillful when this kind of energy comes online. So uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on any of this. Yeah, I was, I've been thinking about Aristotle's um, definition of friendship lately as well and discussing it with various people. And I think, yeah, the third kind of friendship, the idea of, you know, a friendship based on virtue or based on a mutual commitment to the good, um, is yeah, as you say, very rare. It's the highest form of friendship for for Aristotle, and I agree that it's um, in a again in a world that's dominated by kind of exchange and 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 that kind of thing. That most friendships fall into the kind of what can you do for me, or we enjoy hanging out, but there's no kind of higher purpose. And it, and again, there's not really to criticise that. That's that's also the nature of some forms of friendship. But you know, the the higher form, as you say. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about your your point exactly about that that this friendship of the good or the virtuous friendship is harder in some ways between men and women. Um, I mean, I would say I do have several virtuous friendships <laughs> with men um, that aren't uh, dominated by a kind of um, sexual or romantic attraction, but that's not to say that some of them haven't been in the past. I think there's a very complicated thing about having had some form of romantic or sexual relationship with someone but remaining friends with them you know it's it's very that's a very complicated thing I think that happens sometimes quite often um because part of what you liked about the person was also the dialogue and the conversation the you know the infinite conversation um and in some ways then it's easier perhaps to then have a strong friendship with someone who you've had a sexual relationship with but that it, that it that is no longer ongoing because you've kind of explored that option as it were you know and then and if you are able to stay friends you know then it's often a stronger friendship so i don't want to discount that i but i also want to say there's the possibility of having never had a sexual relationship with between men and women but it being a virtuous friendship in aristotle's sense obviously i think that's also possible and i would say i i have those friendships too um i don't to be honest, they're not as strong, perhaps, as some of the, friend, the virtuous friendships that I have with men that I have had a relationship with. And that, that just, it, it is complicated. And yeah, so, but I think your further point though about men, if men are not in the right relationships with one another, they cannot get in the right, right relationships with women is also really significant because it's like, if men are also not holding each other to account or, um, you know, relating to one another in the name of a higher virtue, um, you know, the virtue of friendship itself, but also um, in terms of other questions like loyalty and so on, um, then in a way they're not really set up to understand the role that a woman might play in their life, right? It's either. Um, so, I th yeah, you're right that they're connected, you know, that actually men need to be better friends to one another. <laughs> as well in order for men and women to get along better too um and let's leave aside the question of female friendship because that adds another whole level level of complexity as well and i think you know this it's to to kind of get beyond questions of like rivalry you know is a really truly significant thing if it's even possible you know whether we're talking about jealousy or competition or whatever it's to, to, to raise up to kind of be elevated above those questions is, is, is work, you know, what else is it? But it's, it's worth it, you know, completely. Um, yeah, and, and on the second point about the kind of, uh, the strong felt senses in sexual or romantic attraction. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I, I, I don't know this language exactly that you're talking about the vocabulary of the poly community. I think 
I'm very interested in a kind of Freudian points about ambivalence, you know, that actually ambivalence is often very much more dominant than we would like to think in terms of how we relate to even the people that we love the most, you know, that there's often um, two competing thoughts we might have about somebody or, you know, we might love someone, but also find them really annoying in many ways, including, and, and oneself, to annoy oneself constantly as well is, is the human condition. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. I got a quick follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, uh, it, we talk a lot here about like gaining a power literacy on the world. Uh, and I'm curious if um, if gaining kind of like a, a, a literacy on the sexual marketplace and sexual dynamics would increase um, both sexes to become more virtuous in their relationships with each other. Um, and because you know a lot of seductions about concealment and concealing intentions and being mysterious and all that stuff um but if you had an awareness of the what's happening and the vocabulary for it um would that encourage more virtuous relationships yeah i think so i mean in the the book i've just been writing i tried to say look some of this the language that men use about women in the pickup artist community and the manosphere isn't very pleasant you know it's not a very nice way of seeing women but it's better that we all know about it, right? So that we can start from these terms like hypergamy and, uh, you know, the SMV and stuff and, and to almost work backwards from that. It's like, okay, this is one way of seeing the world, right? It's a particular way of judging other people and judging the opposite sex. And if we all understand that it's possible to see the world like this, then we can actually like pull back from it and think about more playful and, you know, cosmically interesting ways of interacting, you know, but rather than to seek to deny it, I think, which, you know, there would be a kind of knee jerk response, which would be to say, well, all of those discussions are, you know, awful, and, and we should never contemplate them. You know, I, th I think that's unhelpful. So I think, you know, like, it's like Nietzsche and uh, the idea of perspectivism, it's like the more perspectives you can hold in your head at once, you know, the, the kind of, uh, the stronger you are in a certain way, like, if you can contemplate all of these different ways of see seeing and being seen then you're able in a way to kind of um you know stand with them and and above them uh, as well rather than reacting fearfully and saying no i can't possibly consider that way of seeing men or seeing women so yeah so i think the only way the best way out is through <laughs> excellent okay we're gonna go to alistair hi nina uh, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay, it's just the first time using on this computer. Um, so you spoke about that phrase, don't catch feelings, and it p reminded me of uh, the agony of Eros, Byung Chul Han, which I read recently. And uh, he spoke about the, the love as in like a selfless, sort of almost self destructive love for the big O other how in our current neoliberal society, it sort of, it will always appear as a sort of failure. And I guess that sort of links into, we're talking about like risk aversion. And um, and I guess I'm interested in how this sort of thinking seeps into like family dynamics in general and how like, for instance, I'm like 25 and you know, I have certain familiar expectations on me from my parents, which I do think subconsciously affects my ideas about who I should date and that sort of thing. And I guess my question is something along the lines of how do we sort of um, bypass this? I mean, obviously that's a very big question, but maybe you have some thoughts. Like, I guess, how do we pursue a love in this sort of space where it seems almost hell bent on preventing us from actually uh, achieving this big selfless other love, which like Han talks about yeah no that's a brilliant question I think you know what comes to mind is a, I guess the question of courage really and you know to be able to refuse certain expectations is really really difficult I mean it, if you have a family or you know parent or something that implicitly or explicitly says that they want particular things for you beyond your mere you know, presence and continuity, but rather, you know, you should get a proper job or you should date someone 
you know a particular type of person or you know questions of status or whatnot um it's extremely hard to refuse that and and as you say there's it's bigger than that as well that there's there are the little others in our social life but there's the big other as well the idea of a kind of you know thing that doesn't really exist but creates this kind of um social expectation or that we're kind of constantly being seen by this this force um and judged by it actually and how to get beyond that i think is is the kind of question of a of a life in a way i mean like i like personally had to kind of like confront my entire life at a certain point a few years ago and like everything had crap collapsed everything was broken everything was wrong and you know I wrote about it and my mom read it and it was horrific you know she was devastated by what I'd written about you know the various crises that I'd suffered and gone through and it was absolutely horrible. And I had to cross this Rubicon with my mum and say, like, this is my life. This is what my life became, you know, and, and all the time I'd been trying to protect her from it because I didn't want her to worry and I didn't want her to be upset. But actually, it was much worse in the end because I mean, worse and then better, because to have to be honest and to say, I can't do this anymore. My life is 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 um, chaos and hell and that I'm really very ill and, you know, I'm struggling and suffering. And then to be able to write about it and to explain it and then to kind of move beyond that and to become something else out of the wreckage um, was for me personally, just a very important moment. And I decided to try to live consistently from then on and to be honest and to not lie and to, you know, whether, to protect other people's feelings either not that doesn't mean to be brutal that's not the opposite of not lying is is being you know violently honest right but there's a way of being true or truer to oneself and to live consistently and to say I don't want these sorts of things like I'm just not cut out for this kind of life or you know that I love this person or you know that it is is um a massive um jump for a lot of people you know I have a lot of um respect for people who've never had to kind of um have a crisis <laughs> in that way who've always been able to be consistent for whatever set of reasons or be around people who are kind of understanding and accepting or, or to accept themselves actually you know first and foremost and a lot a lot of the time I think that kind of um internalized big other worry doesn't necessarily exist in the way that you think it will you know once you actually say look I don't want to do this and my life is horrible you know it's what people are primarily concerned about you not about you continuing to be this fantasy image um that they might have had you know most people want you to be okay if they care about you in any way whatsoever <laughs> and some people would just disappear anyway but you know so I yeah I think it's a very um deep question and I think it can only be answered sort of personally through experience. Uh, thanks very much. Right. Thank you. Dean, would you like to ask your question? Hey Nina, uh, what do you think a healthy modern men mo men's movement should look like that can unify with feminism in a generative way? rather than defensively or pathologically react to it? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And it, it, um, it relates very much to the project that I've been trying to do for the last two years. And also I think um, to Peter's question about um, virtue and male friendship and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think partly there has to be more sort of humor involved in, in, in understanding the relation between men and women. I think, I think it's become so pathologically fearful and frightened, you know, for all the reasons that we've been discussing, that there is like the kind of lightness and playfulness has, has sort of disappeared from a lot of social and, and social life. And, and obviously, you know, the more we're isolated, anatomized, the harder that becomes. And so I wonder if there's a way in which you know, something like humour, I mean, a lot of the humour that is now really kind of um, censored and no platformed and banned and, you know, uh, deemed inappropriate 
was really about noticing and joking about the differences between men and women, right? And, and you know, that, that there is a kind of release valve idea that actually if you kind of say these sort of mocking things in a particular way, it's not necessarily hateful, you know, and we're seeing this kind of attempt to expand the de definition of hate at the moment, which I think is very, very dangerous because, you know, there's a way of gently mocking each other and ourselves, right, which is actually very, very important to avoid these kind of deeper forms of resentment and actual genuine hatred building up, you know, because it's a kind of, you know, back and forth, you know, bouncing back. And so I think, I think there's got to be a lot of humor, right, in the, in whatever a kind of um, healthy modern men's movement should look like. I mean, I personally have absolutely no problem with like the manabund idea or men doing things with each other. There's a lot, again, a lot of kind of criticism of the idea of like, men being with each other um, as if sex seg segregated spaces or movements were always going to be dubious. I don't think they are. I, I think it's very natural to want to spend time with members of the same sex. I think there's something very lovely and beautiful about it. It's a different kind of way of being, you know, and, and so I think, yeah, for, I don't know, for that to be more socially acceptable, actually, for men to be friends, to be, you know, to be, um, more respected actually and I think yeah I mean it goes back um I think you know to to Amy's point about language and the way that we talk about each other or to each other and when we talk about um the opposite sex to our friends there's a way of doing it kind of mockingly and critically but also humorously that isn't hateful you know that isn't horrible it's like have you noticed how men do this like oh yes that's really funny isn't it it's like you know, there's something sweet about it, and that, all that sort of sweetness and light seems to be hard to hard to find. Um, yeah, but I but I, but I do think that the, the 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 kind of deeper point, maybe in what you're saying, is that as I, and I say this in in the book as well, that actually there are a surprising number of compatibilities between, particularly second wave feminism and some of the men's right movement. They're not actually so vehemently opposed as you might imagine. You know that what a lot of the time people are talking about are you know what masculinity is and how it also affects men you know that actually we have very narrow visions of these things and a lot of second wave feminists wrote very interesting books about masculinity you know that weren't slamming men you know but rather kind of identifying these sort of gendered patterns of expectation and they were very sympathetic actually you know so i think also to mischaracterize there's a lot of mischaracterizations of feminism as if it's kind of like just women who hate men, you know, and per perversely and paradoxically, there is a kind of contemporary form of fake feminism, which is the media sort of divisive femi so-called feminism, which does do that. But I don't think the second wave really was, a, was ever really about that, even in its very extreme forms. You know, there are some outliers like Solanis, you know, but the nature of her text is so bizarre, it's, it's, it's hard to pin her down. She's not, you know, she's not sort of central to that movement. And so, you know, yeah, I, I think there's a lot more compatibility than might be imagined. And again, it's that not being fearful, not immediately reacting and cutting off what the other is saying. Uh, quick follow up. So uh, I'm just wondering, because second wave feminism doesn't seem to be the hegemonic um, dominating form of feminism right now. And I feel like a lot of women don't have much of a desire to return to it. I'm um, thinking about like xenofeminism, for example, wanting to liberate themselves from the female reproduction system. Um, I'm wondering what you think about like sort of building the bridge between uh, sort of your version of second wave feminism and more modern waves of feminism with a with a healthier men's movement. Um yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of probably much, I'm much more critical of the kind of techno um, feminist side. I've written a long piece about Shulamith Firestone, whose dialectic of sex is really at the kind of heart of that, that strand of feminism, which um, seeks to kind of liberate, quote unquote, women from um, reproduction through the use of technology. Um, obviously, we were talking last week about kind of the sexual revolution and birth control and, and, um, you know that that form of uh, reproductive technology and what that permitted and what it took away. Um, so I'm not fully on board with the 
a kind of that um, <laughs> that genre of feminism, um, I should say, because I, I also think that, you know, the Xeno Feminist Manifesto talks about if nature is unjust, then change nature. I think this isn't possible. I think, you know, that actually part of the refusal of any discussion of essentialism or nature or the difference between men and women is actually part of the problem. You know, and that actually to be more honest and to to talk about these things is uh, far more um, philosophically rigorous and socially sensible thing to do. You know, and I think this kind of fantasizing about um, a post nature world or, you know, is actually, uh, again, just completely compatible with a sort of Silicon Valley, you know, techno capitalist um, image of the world, which I which I refuse. Cool. Uh, Laura, would you like to ask a question? Is that me? Are you yeah. Laura? Okay. Oh, what? <laughs> Laura. Laura, <No>. my bad. <laughs> um, I mean, I was just kind of throwing it out into the space. It's not really a question. Um, it's a question that I live into, I've been living into for a while, but I'll speak it and see if there's responses that want to happen. Um, so I was riffing on on Peter's question earlier, um, and how do we develop uh, the capacity to first acknowledge and then second navigate eros when it arises in the relational field? Um, and this can be between friendship, but I also think this is something in the workplace. There's something about the turning away from Eros that seems really not in service um, and something about turning toward it and developing capacity around, around reflexivity and also even being able to tolerate it in one's body, nervous system. Yeah, uh, yeah that's a really interesting point. I, I think the word that just comes to mind is like maturity, <laughs> like actually how difficult it is to, to for, for anybody to deal kind of in an adult way with these complexes, the, the complex feelings. And, um, you know, it would be amazing to live in a world in which you could say to somebody that you work with, oh, I, you know, I, I have these sort of like minor sexual desires towards you but I also find you very interesting and I I don't necessarily want to have a sexual relationship with you but nevertheless there's a sort of erotic chart you know like what that would be a very very strange world and may, maybe it wouldn't be better I don't I don't know like there is you know again this kind of question of secrecy and playfulness also depends upon not revealing these things you know like keeping people guessing or whatever like there's a way of flirting which which hides those things you know and and actually if we lived in a purely earnest world in which everybody went around saying well I you know I, I sort of have 35 percent lust for you and 20 percent admiration and you know it would be very weird I mean I'm sure there are there are ways of doing that but um when you're maybe already in a particular community or something but um yeah I I so I don't know like is it an yeah to to be an adult uh I I I don't know. I mean, I think in the first place, maybe it's a question of understanding one's own desire. I mean, in a way, when Kant and other philosophers talk about autonomy, you know, autonomy is basically being able to give oneself the law, right? It's not being at the mercy of other people's laws or expectations or demands or, you know, whether it's a government or, or the culture or whatever. So that actually, you know, to have autonomy over oneself and also from a kind of magic point of view would be to um, understand one's own desires first and foremost like to have control of one's own eros you know and to be able to kind of um, you know use it and manipulate it you know hopefully not in a negative way right but to be kind of um, yeah um, playful with it if, if that's what one wants to be um, but yeah I I don't know I, it, it's it's yeah, I don't know. Maybe Peter, you want to say something on this because you had a comment here. Uh, the right relationship with one's arrows is that uh... the kind of capacity to acknowledge and navigate eros in 
the sort of relational field as a, you know as, as Laura put it yeah what we were what came up for me when you were talking is you know just kind of having a deep understanding of the contours of your own kind of lust and desire and being in relationship with that instead of being at war with it or reacting against it and not having that examined um and then there's you can be playful then i think if that occurs or more mm. playful but yeah brutal honesty in the face of one's own desire don't know <laughs> may or may not work <laughs> but it might work i don't know <laughs> cool uh Philip. Philip has some really good questions. Maybe we'll just start with the first one and then see where we go. Yeah, so a bit indulgent. So. <laughs> uh, hi Nina, thanks. Um, the first is about resentment and then about roof and then about roles and responsibility. So resentment. Um, yes, I was wondering what so it was interesting to think about what the men's movement could do with, with resentment and legitimizing these monogendered spaces. I sort of I wondered what beliefs or rituals would be an antidote to resentment, thinking that like much of this resentment is legitimate and some of it has been egged on by the media. Some of it has like been crystallized helpfully or unhelpfully by like consciousness raising in the women's liberation. And some of it's like when you're engaging that resentment. And so I think of Camille Paglia think, talking about uh, like anima possession. Like so there's this like legitimate legitimate resentment that's there, but then it's it's amplified. So how do what I don't know, if 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 trying to reconcile, so if the, the project is reconciling genders, like there's me as man with a woman as woman, but then there's kind of the way that I exist as as a cipher for something bigger and, and they as that. At any any positive rituals or beliefs or similar. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really important question and I think it you know if we're talking about a kind of sec you know largely secularized society you know regardless of people's individual beliefs and of course you know they still exist but you know if you if we live in a kind of largely desacralized deritualized world right in which the rituals as as Adam said are like Black Friday right you're allowed to go shopping but you're not allowed to hang out with your family or go to church right I mean this is full-on uh, which which of the George Romero zombie films is the consumerist one? Day of the Dead. Anyway, that one maybe. Is it one of the well, one of them? One of them where the zombies are all consumers. Like we're in that world now. And um, but yeah, so the ritual thing. I mean, again, talking about people like R. D. Lang and David Cooper. I mean, they suggest that basically people come up with their own rituals. You know, and I mean, obviously there are still still some rituals that exist and have social meaning, like marriage. We talked about this, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and so I don't know that the playfulness is also perhaps coming up with your own rituals, you know, and I think to do these things and to kind of create their own meaning, you know, to create sort of sacred meaning in a world that is desacralized is a, is a kind of challenge, you know, and it's, I mean, that's, that's, but what, where else can you go really? Otherwise you're just kind of in this sort of, you know, very unsacred, world kind of constantly um i think to recognize that you say that the the kinds of resentment that are encouraged but they're also like belong internally as well like the struggles that everybody has with their own you know feminine and masculine sides or with their um you know with their own desire uh with um yeah their own activity and passivity their relation to the world it's like in the first place, it kind of has to be um, really understood in the depths, you know, insofar as it's possible, but it's like an ongoing project, you know, because otherwise you will start to see the world in, in terms of your own resentments. You're like you'll start to project things onto the opposite sex, but really maybe what you're doing is attacking that part of yourself, you know, and saying it belongs over there, but it doesn't, it's you, like you're seeing, you know, hostility or, yeah. Cool. Uh, Philip, do you want to ask your ne next yeah. question? Um, yeah. Um, okay. Roosh V. I, I, I fell down the Roosh V rabbit warren at some point in the last week or two. And um, I think he's interesting in this uh, Qui Bono uh, question because I, like, I find his, like his, he has a sense of mission. Like it's quite invigorating, um, but totally unhinged. Um, and I just wondered, so like his, his piece of like masturbation is a capitalist conspiracy. Um, and I just wondered if in uh, What Men Want, um, 
whether you've done anything to steal man Roosh's uh, position on on that that sort of that that angle. Um, yeah, no, I mean, in a way, I kind of use him as a sort of interesting um, phenomenon, I suppose. It's like he's he he features really only as a kind of oh, how strange, or maybe not so strange, that this person who built his entire career on sleeping with women and writing about it now suddenly has this kind of midlife realization that that was the worst thing he could have done and you know I mean I think masturbation is capitalist conspiracy I mean we talked about nofap um in previous weeks and um you know the the very long traditions of kind of like tantra and Chinese alchemy and and you know ways of like um believing that withholding one seed is a form of you know power or energetics um you know has a long sort of backstory and I I mean, there are people who do very much think that the kind of dissipation of energy in the form of like consumption of pornography um, is something that is deliberate, like that, that people, you know, that the large amount of free pornography, like the infinite amount, is um, actually beneficial to the powers that be. And I mean, Rush is not the only person to make this claim that pornography has this deliberately destructive effect on the kind of um you know energy of young men and also the political energy of the population if you like so i don't i wouldn't necessarily defend that position in a certain way but i like with a lot of these things i think they're very very interesting and worthy of discussion if you see what i mean so Mm -hmm. rush is more a kind of example than than anything else for me at the moment but i'm still doing the final edit so maybe i'll check in on what he's done very recently (laughs) Yeah, because nofap tends to be about self-actualization, and I'm I'm interested in this like like the secret society against capitalism and these these ways in which actually, without it becoming conspiratorial, I feel I feel I feel my own I don't know I feel I collapse into a temptation to be conspiratorial, um, and I I'd love to buttress a position that was a little bit less rouge v and maybe a little bit more anchored. Um, yeah, no, I understand completely. Um, yeah, to, how to stay sane is a question for everybody, constantly. <laughs> Shall I ask my third? I f- feel like I'm in, being indulged, but I'll um, yeah. ask about roles and responsibilities. Um, so choreographing gender roles and responsibilities in community um, that would make um, romantic engagements less exploitable and to enfranchise platonic celibate interactions. So I was just wondering who yeah, it feels like choreographing the like the felicity conditions for d- doing doing that reconciled thing that's not can't be exploited by um, things. So I, I wondered, so this is a slightly convoluted question, um, whether there are any intermediate scale communities who've sought to create rules for the game. So gamifying this in a way that's non exploitative. So say Amish groups or like that sort of thing does a does a closeness to nature or a less hypermobile way. Both, both romantic and just friendships. I feel like friendships are really thin because we're really hypermobile, and like, um, and and romantic relationships feel like they uh, they're un uncalibrated. So I just wondered if if you've seen people gamifying it as say maybe conservative religious communities do, or like because they set the rules of the game. They say these are the rules of the game. Come and play, um, rather than the sort of anarchic free for all. And I just most of the most of the people who are gamifying it, who are setting the games, it's either becomes Tinder or it becomes something like weird, and everyone wears weird clothes, and and it's all not it's not scalable, and it and it doesn't it's not it feels quite coercive. So I, I wonder if I don't know if you've come across people doing redemptive gamifying of it's a, possibilities. yeah. It's a really, really interesting question. I mean, it, it sort of occurs to me that in a way, philosophy is like one of the oldest games you know, that actually the the dialogue with your philosophical partner is um, something that, you know, to some extent resists commodification. You know, when I think about an image of freedom, I think about walking outside with my friend talking, you know, in a dialogue, like this is what freedom is to me, is that it's being outside talking with my virtuous friend and, or my friend who's, committed to virtue and and so that and in a way that 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 is uh cost me nothing right it's free like we're literally 
outside, we're not anywhere, we are together. Of course, in the current restrictions, this is precisely the kind of thing that is being taken away, is the opportunity for these incredibly minor acts of freedom, if you see what I mean. But so, so it really, it's, a, it's just a very funny thought that occurs to me, like what if philosophy in a way is this kind of, you know, the ultimate longest, oldest gamifying <laughs> of, um, you know, these forms of interaction. You know, because they're, they're not reducible to any form of uh, commodification in a certain way. Like it, is, it sort of is what it is. You know, its value and its virtue is in its being and it's unfolding. It has no other purpose. You know, it's not recorded. It's not for anything. It doesn't cost it. You know, it's, it's just the pure, you know, being of that dialogue and yeah, so I, I, yeah, I don't know what, what to say on that point, but I don't know. I think I think in a way that these are the things, these seemingly very small things that must be defended above all else. You know, this is what they'll go for in the name of gamifying everything on their terms, right? Because every, you know, everything can be gamified, and to refute. I mean, I'm talking about playfulness and inventing new games and new rituals, but actually, there's a there's another way in which like resisting the gamification of everything must be part of it if 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 the games are not set on your own terms you know if you're just accepting other people's rules but yeah it's a very good question great thanks philip uh okay we're gonna go to alex would you like to ask your question hey nina i just wanted to ask about um uh, the relationship as you see it now between your project and psychoanalysis. I suppose I ask because um, the things you've been talking about in this series and in your forthcoming book kind of at the heart of psychoanalysis and um, but at the same time from what you've said elsewhere I think it's the case that you've somewhat steered clear of psychoanalysis in the writing of your new book even though um, obviously Freud in a way features in the title. And so I, I suppose I wondered about that, and maybe this is too big a question, but I suppose I wondered about what you thought about the relationship between um, maybe philosophy and psycho psychoanalysis more broadly, and where the tensions are. And last thing, just really specifically, I think it comes up for me most when you're talking about desire, because I feel like uh, maybe psychoanalysis has means to distinguish between quite different things, they might be related, but quite different things when you're talking about desire. And actually, um, if you don't manage to distinguish those things, then you, it, ho it holds you back somehow uh, in thinking them through. So what, what, that... th what things specifically? What things, go on, what do you mean? Um, well, in the distinguishing between desire in- Oh, I suppose, well, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll um, probably kind of uh, somewhat kind of gloss this, but I suppose when people talk about desire, sometimes they seem to be talking about um, actually ideals. So, uh, and that would necessarily imply some kind of relation to another for, for which those ideals are to be preferred or whatever. Then there's the more psychoanalytic sense of a desire as something that's an effect of a relation to a fantasy object. That seems kind of related, but kind of distinct. And then there's desire in the sense, maybe like Raven said something like this in one of the other sessions, she said, you know, it's possible aside from ideals, what are ideals for other people? It would be possible, for instance, to want to get married. You know, I want to get married and it doesn't have anything to do with anyone else. It's just what I want, you know, and that would be even, even a dis that would be even distinct from the more psychoanalytic sense of desire, which is doesn't have an object this is a desire that's not an ideal, and it also seems to have an object. So they seem to me to be three quite distinct ways of thinking about desire. And if you don't manage to, I mean, there are more obviously in philosophy, no, no doubt, but if you don't manage to make these distinctions, then it, it's not clear what you're talking about when you say, for instance, our culture is based on doing what you want. And that seems to me to mean quite a few different things, 
some of which uh, would be okay from my perspective, it seems. Anyway, that's it. Yeah. No, sure. No, I think I think you're right. I mean, it's it is it's it's a kind of tricky question. I mean, how to write or speak about these things in a let's say more or less popular way that then also you know doesn't you know maybe it's not possible you know to kind of conflate or skip over some of the more kind of um, subtle and knotty ways that psychoanalysis in particular has historically and continues to kind of discuss these things and I like I wouldn't for a second say that that um, I, I've, I've in any way sort of um, succeeded in any way in doing that um, either here or in the in the book and I think you know I mean if you look at kind of Elenka Zupanchit's work in What is Sex you know it's a very interesting book and it, it it kind of makes it very clear that in a way we don't really know like <laughs> that the, the desire you know yes of course we can think about the free flows of desire in the kind of mid 20th century and this kind of project of like unleashing the flows and people like Deleuze and Grattery and the sexual revolution and you know and then we can talk about the capture of desire by kind of um, commodification and consumer capitalism and the idea that people are kind of being sold or you know they're having desires created it's like you think you want this thing and you know um, you internalize that and you know but desire is also like incredibly um, obscure and um, murky and basically on some level also destructive you know it's potentially very it's not of course, you know, when Freud talks about beyond the pleasure principle, it's obvious that there are drives or a, a, an aspect of drive which is destructive. You know, that, they, that, that human beings don't purely seek pleasure or the good, as philosophers might talk about, um, but that desire is something often like extremely um, negatively generative and you know, for Freud, obviously, the vast majority of sexual interaction is perverse in a strict sense, because it's not reproductive and human beings kind of live in this very ambiguous, ambivalent world of, of feeling and sensation, um, whose meaning is, is often impossible to ascertain, <laughs> to even get close to it. Um, so yeah, I, I think you're, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right about the, the caution in talking about desire, um, you know, and I try to, in a slightly lighthearted way, go through some of the different ways of thinking about desire in the book. Um, you know, and I, 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 just one final thing about what you say about the relationship between philosophy and psychoanalysis, you know, Lacan has this very funny thing at some point where he says that they're kind of constantly rubbing up against each other, you know, he makes it like a kind of almost frottage idea, you know, it's like a sexual thing, they're, they're sort of like this, you know, and that it's a kind of mutually stimulating but also kind of irritating relationship. Um, and I think the question of, of whether one is coming at things philosophically or psychoanalytically is again, unresolvable in some way, um, but they can't stop rubbing each other somehow. <laughs> Great. Thank you. This is a good place to, to end. <laughs> the grinding of philosophy and psychoanalysis. Um, Excellent. I think we're going to begin to do our kind of closing ritual here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for questions. And thank you, Nina. I'm going to tag in Peter to talk about some events, and then we'll do a, a close out. Cool. So uh, upcoming events, um, I got some exciting ones. Uh, Nina, I'd, I'd, I'd really love it for you to come to this event. Uh, are you familiar with Jack Donovan, uh, The Way of Men? Uh, yes, I know what you I have that book. Yes. yes. So he's coming to the STOA December 10th, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time to talk about his book. I'd love it for Nina to ask him a juicy question. Um, so it'd be uh, a fun. Uh, that just got um, posted on the website. And then in, in uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time, uh, about 30 minutes, um, collective presencing uh, session. I'm going to be there. So if you want to jump in that, that should be fun. It's a really good conversational modality to get in right relationship with everything. Um, so that being said, uh, I'll take Raven back in. Excellent. Well, Nina, this is our final session. 
It has been such a pleasure to have you and to have these kind of ideas in our minds and kind of in the Stoic community. And so I wanted to ask, are there any, any final words that you want to leave us with before we wrap up this four part series? Um, no, just to say once again, thank you for the invitation um, to talk about some of these ideas with you all and um, yeah, to just be very grateful for the kind of really thoughtful and respectful way in which people are talking about these things and they're, they're, they are very big and often very emotive um, subjects and I'm sure, I've, you know, I've said things that like are potentially maybe upsetting or controversial um, and I'm just very grateful that people have um, responded in the way they have and I've really enjoyed it. Wonderful. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Lots of gratitude for everyone. And uh, we'll see you around the, the, the campfire, <laughs> the digital campfire. <laughs> Alrighty. Bye, Nina. And bye, everybody. <laughs>